Hi, I'm Mauro Porcini, PepsiCo's Chief Design Officer. Join me for our new series where we dive into the minds of the greatest innovators of our time, with the goal of finding what drives them in their professional journey and in their personal life. Trying to uncover the universal truths that unite anyone attempting to have a meaningful impact in the world. This is In Your Shoes. As a design leader, you need to build meaningful relationships across the business. Design is only successful when its value and potential is fully understood and utilized by as many people, teams, and departments as possible. There is so much more power in showing the value and direct impact design can have to the business through projects than there is in talking about it. I'm quoting our guest of today, who is the VP of design at Booking.com and previously was the head of design at the Wall Street Journal. In these roles, he was and he is responsible today for the user experience and user interfaces of the different apps, websites, publishing tools, newsletters, and voice products of the two companies. Before joining the Wall Street Journal, he was also the founder of BTP Design, an award-winning Australian branding and digital product design agency. He won a 2018 Web Award for Best News App. Is a board member of the Australian Graphic Design Association by an art committee and is given talks on the power of design at several events all around the world. Shay Douglas, welcome to In Your Shoes. Thank you, Aaron. It's such a pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, and I am in New York and you are far, far, far away from us all the way in Australia. And I think this is the magic of uh, these digital technologies that connect us all from every corner of the planet. We talk about walls and visas and countries, but at the end of the day, this digital world unifies us more than ever. So you're based right now. Where are you in Australia? I'm in a uh, small town called Albury uh, in the country on my wife's family farm. Um, we've just traveled back from Amsterdam through the pandemic uh, about a month and a half ago uh, to be with family, to have our first child. Oh, congratulations. So that's, been, that's been an adventure. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> that's a fantastic news. And Australia is where... Everything started. I mean, you, you are from there. You study design in Melbourne, in a, uh, there in Australia. Uh, how did you arrive all the way then to the US and more recently uh, in Amsterdam? We, we met in New York a few years ago when you were working for the Wall Street Journal. So how did you get here? Yeah, we did. Um, so, look, it's, a, it's an interesting story. I think... Um, I start, like you said, I started my design career in Melbourne. Uh, I studied communication design at uh, the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. And, and from there, um, <clears throat> actually found it quite difficult getting a job out of university. It took me a year. Um, so in that year, I was kind of freelancing here and there to survive. And then a friend of mine uh, worked at our, uh, our sports league, the Australian Football League. And he was an illustrator uh, and actually invited me on to um, help out for, with some projects. I ended up landing a full-time job there, which was my first full-time job out of university. Uh, I worked there for about three years. Um, and they were mainly in publishing. So they were doing a lot of kind of print. Um, but during that time, you know, web design, as well as other kind of digital mediums and, and uh, brand identity work were starting to kind of come towards them. So I ended up uh, helping win a few projects there and, and dabbled in my first kind of website design as well as uh, front-end coding, etc. Uh, and also won some brand identity work. And then out of that, I basically just kind of decided why not, why not kind of quit and start my business. In that year freelancing, I had a little bit of fun. Um, and I, over, over a course of about nine years in Melbourne, uh, built, built a company, employed lots of people, uh, did a lot of brand identity work, packaging work, environmental work with architects, interior designers, um, and had a lot of fun doing a lot of creative projects around the world, actually. And then from there, um, a friend of mine, a guy called Paul Meller, had had recently uh, been working with Google and asked to uh, be the interim CTO with Dow Jones and eventually the chief technology with Dow Jones, chief technology officer with Dow Jones. And he... Um, at that time, again, kind of the 
the software industry, particularly within uh, news organisations, was something that was kind of new in comparison to graphic design and traditional print media. So they wanted someone that had worked across you know, brand identity right through to all the different kind of touch points and experiences as well as software development. So uh, I, I kind of land, luckily landed an opportunity there, met a lot of folks and um, they offered me a role to move over and head up digital design. So I ended up um, moving to New York uh, with my now wife and had a, a lot of a lot of fun at Dow Jones and predominantly working primarily with the Wall Street Journal for five years and uh, and in the newsroom there and I mean it's it's a funny time right now with where you are in the world and with the election on and I remember sitting in the newsroom right in the middle of it uh, yeah this time four years ago so um, that that kind of change and now being back in Australia and, and my adventures from there to Amsterdam have been a lot of fun and a, and a really interesting journey a lot a lot of learnings and and Kind of here we are today. So that's that's a little bit of the story uh, from how so I you, arrived you, in New York. Th- there are many people listening to us that are not designers, and, mm-hmm. and 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 for many people probably it's not that clear what the designer does in the digital world. You know, both in, in the Wall Street Journal, then in Booking. dot mm-hmm. coms, uh, there are design leaders in Spotify, in in so many digital services, there is design and design is more important than ever. But can you explain to the people listening to us what you did in uh, the Wall Street Journal and then in uh, in, now in bookings.com? What what is the role of a designer? Well, I think one, we have to kind of acknowledge how how kind of young as an industry it is in in software development. uh, you know, software engineers have been working and coding for a lot longer than we were designing interfaces for it in the same kind of scale and capacity. So it's a, it's a, I would say, very kind of young industry. We still have a really long way to go, a long way to mature. But what it means to me is, is simply what design's always been doing, and that's you know, making the world a better place um, through human connection, working with people to understand their needs, their wants, all the things that you've said many, many times over, their desires, and 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 build products, services, experiences for them. Um, you know, I think we've lost some of the magic of creativity in software development because it gets so complex and scales so quickly, and you're working with so many people. So it all ends up being about people, how you collaborate with your colleagues and different crafts and disciplines. And how you also engage with businesses and uh, are able to kind of translate all the things that you do uh, daily and the, the things your teams and uh, the teams, et cetera, do um, into something that, that is actually tangible for them. It, unlike kind of having a CFO, a chief design officer is, is fairly new for a lot of businesses. Um, and so I think, you know, we have, uh, we carry a lot of weight in our shoulders right now to make sure that we're kind of carrying the torch, but we're also at the same time defining what it means to be in the the head design role at a large organization and leading design um, and all of the different aspects for it. You, you mentioned the size of these organizations and your, your mm-hmm. challenge is, is so similar to mine. In PepsiCo, we serve mm-hmm. the masses, you know, and. And it's not easy because you want to please them all, but they have different, they have diverse and different tastes, different needs and wants. How, how do you, how did you deal with all of this, both in, uh, in the Wall Street Journal and then in, uh, in, in Booking.com? Uh, I, I honestly, lots of conversations. So I think thinking that you know everything coming in early is probably one of the the bad traits i had early on as a designer and the more and more i've learned to sit back and listen and ask questions and continue to learn and absorb information the more i've realized that through listening you build relationships and through the relationships you build um, organizations are built and made up of lots of different people from diverse backgrounds so understanding what their motivations are what their purpose is why they come to work first even before you get into the work you're doing with them is actually incredibly important otherwise you're never able to kind of 
understand kind of where they're coming from, what their point of view is, and try really hard um, to 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 kind of, well, I guess, you know, pardon the pun, but walk in their shoes to a, to a matter of speaking. So I think that piece is really important. So I, I invest so much time in, you know, talking to everybody at all levels of the organization. I think it's incredible, incredibly important. And and from all departments, I don't think we need to just purely focus on designers or copywriters or anyone else. I think we need to actually engage with mainly, particularly as design leaders, uh, all the other areas so they understand all the things we're doing. And we also understand the thing we understand the things they're doing as well. And in the Wall Street Journal, you build the capability from scratch. There was not a design function before you, or there was? Oh, no, there was. I mean, there was a huge design function. Um, but if you think about it, mainly it was to do with uh, creating and laying out the printed newspaper uh, and, and creating graphics and charts to do with the stories every day. You know, we would, you know the journalists would write up to about 130 stories a day. So you needed a lot of rich visual content for that. So there are a lot of what I would probably more describe as visual journalists that had design backgrounds often that would be translating the journalism into rich visual content. Um, and yeah, that, there was probably upwards of nearly 100 people kind of working across the organization doing that. Um, and and what I think I, I brought a slightly different lens. So I added some new capabilities. So we we looked more at information architecture and user research and copywriting and brand identity design and fused that with all the user interface and user experience design capabilities. Um, and that's what we matured while I was there mainly, um, rather than the kind of traditional print rich uh, piece that had been working for a really long time prior. And, and then you moved from New York to Amsterdam to Booking.com. So what's your yeah. mission there? Yeah, at Booking.com, I mean, Booking.com's mission is for everyone to experience the world. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a lovely place to be. It was a strange time to join because we joined <laughs> during a pandemic. So I'm not sure <laughs> picking a travel company during a pandemic is the best idea, but... I want to hear look, everything about that. Yeah, as soon as you tell me about your yeah. role as a designer, then I want to hear exactly. about you know, how you're dealing with a global yeah. pandemic in that kind of conference. So, yeah, I, look, I think there's just so much opportunity in travel. I think it, it's, it's a really rich industry. There's, you know, so many household name brands that we know, like Expedia and Airbnb and, and um, Booking Holdings. We own Kayak and... Agoda and Open Table, so not just Booking.com as well as Priceline.com in the US. So our footprint is really, really large. Um, you know, nearly a billion hotel bookings a year, and um, our audience is incredibly diverse. So you know, what really attracted me to come to Booking was that, kind of similar to the Wall Street Journal, you're getting to touch the lives of so many people at a point where they're making this decision to actually take precious time off and go and do something, experience the world, travel, create memories. And there's something really powerful about being a part of that uh, and enabling it and making it easier for people. And so I think that's what really drew me to it. You know, I think that kind of mobility space of people, like I've spent a, lo a lot of my kind of last 10 years traveling, you know, from moving from Australia to New York to Amsterdam now. And during that time overseas, being an expat and on different visas, um, I've also spent a lot of time exploring America and Canada and Africa and, and other continents. And, and travel is just such a big part of who we are, where you get to experience different cultures. And what I also loved about booking was that the headquarters being based in Amsterdam that attracted so many different people from different walks of life from all around the world to come and build these digital products and, and build a business there. Um, and a very, very kind of diverse group. So, you know, that being a English speaker and my first kind of meetings where I would run through work or kind of get to know me, et cetera, with some of the teams, people had to kind of constantly slow me down and interject. And I felt very awkward at the end because they were all basically 
English was their second language. And, you know, I was this imposter kind of coming in. And so I had to really recalibrate and really, you know, um, think about how I, you know, uh, engaged with everyone and realized just how diverse the group was there. And that was also something that attracted me to it. Um, and that we build products for people, you know, our products serve 47 different languages. So incredibly complex in that vein as well. So the, there's a lot, a lot to do, a lot of complexity, a lot to unpack, but I, I also love simplicity. So I thought it was a big challenge. And was design already established? You are taking it to the next level. What, What's the situation there with design? Yeah, look, heavily invested in. So, you know, upwards of 260 designers, you know, dig digital designers, so UX and UI, um, 60 plus UX copywriters, lots of user researchers. So, you know, in the, the kind of frame of, of what a lot of the big tech companies would um, kind of put under the umbrella of design, there's hundreds. Um, so the company had clearly kind of decided to invest heavily in design. I think where I came in was, you know, there, there'd never been a VP of design before me. So it was a new role. So they'd realized that kind of at scale, we probably need to think about how we design at scale, um, how we really set up a cohesive design strategy for the entire company. We need someone to come in and do that. You know, the community is too large to almost self-organize and be able to do that and have a voice at the right level of the organization and attached to the business. So I was, yeah, that, that was really my challenge and the role that I came into play. And so it was new and, um, yeah, joined in October last year. So I've been there for just over a year now. So the first, so I, the, the good part <laughs> is I got to spend some time in the office. So that was good. <laughs> And how is it all changing in the middle of a pandemic, that kind of industry? People not traveling anymore or not as much, obviously, as before. Look, early on, you know, we almost hit the reverse button because one of our value, value propositions is that you can cancel. And so I think a lot of what Booking.com is known for is that ability to just cancel last minute and, and get a refund. So that... Um, almost commitment to our customers uh, impacted us heavily, um, not, lo not only on top of the fact that most people were not traveling uh, and airlines were shutting down and borders were closing. So as a business, we were heavily impacted. Um, you know, we've seen some return, particularly in domestic travel and people wanting to book homes or, uh, you know, rental cars, et cetera, to, to move locally, to just get out, get, get a break, get away from your kind of screen for a few days. Um, so that, that's obviously a change. Um, I, I would expect aspects of that to persist for sure, but we're really not going to see a lot of a return until, you know, I would say like 2019 until a, a while after a vaccine and uh, hopefully also um, a cure as well so yeah those two things combined we'll, we'll see see things return but it will be a while that's for sure but it was and, yeah absolutely heavily impacted how do you think um, the way we work will change after the pandemic well i mean personally speaking i i absolutely miss the energy that i get from my colleagues and and being in a room and that creative energy that you get from just walking past someone's desk, grabbing a coffee, going into a room, more ad hoc sessions. While it feels like it should be easier because everyone's just already set up in their office to just jump on a quick Zoom call. Um, it's actually, I find it a lot more kind of fatiguing and challenging. Um, and you miss all of the body language and the nuances and the interactions where you kind of go from talking about work to checking in to see how someone's feeling because they might be kind of not quite there that day. They might be feeling quite right. Um, so I look, I, I personally on that, that aspect, I, I very miss the dimension of a uh, creative workplace um, and getting energy from colleagues. And I know people get energy from all, all sources, but that's one that I definitely do and definitely gets me up in the morning. Um, and so I think, but I think there's also a lot of good things that have, come out of it where 
um, you know, I'm in a, in a in a lucky position where I've been able to jump on a plane to be with family, um, even though it was incredibly difficult to get home. Um, almost a privileged position to a degree to have a baby and be close to family. And um, while that's kind of a unique circumstance at this point, there's aspects of that that may change because we've realised that uh, remote work is is possible. Huge businesses switched over just like that and it worked. You know, we're all set up, our tech was there, our IT support was there and giant multinational companies like ours were able to just kind of flick the switch and 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 change the way we work and and make do look and i don't think it's perfect and i think we we do need those uh human connections and time and space in offices um but i think there's a few barriers to that there's obviously all sorts of tax implications and and jurisdictions and different regions if you're a big global company um and i think we'll kind of start working through some of those things, I would say. Um, the biggest companies will obviously kind of push for those changes going forward and hopefully we'll see a bit more flexibility around all of those things. Um, but it's a new precedent and you know, we're yet, we're yet to see kind of what happens on the other side of it. I totally, totally agree. It's gonna, it's a beautiful design project by itself to redesign the way oh, we're working yes. in this hybrid kind of, world will we live in more and more in the future yeah. uh, talking about people and ways of working and teams um how there are many companies out there that right now are trying to figure out how to create a digital design team a team focused on the digital platforms uh, what would you recommend to any business leader out there or design leader out there that wants to build a digital design team, what they need to do, what kind of capabilities, where to start from, what mistakes to avoid? Mm. Great question. I, you know, I think you have to always start with the why. So uh, why do we think we need a digital design team? Um, That's a good point. And, why, why do you really, think companies will yeah. need it? What, what would yeah. you say to a market? That, oh, I don't know if I really need it. Do you think they need it? Is a generic oh, okay. question. <laughs> yeah, like if you have any interface with customers, any experiential touch points with customers where people are engaging with your product or service, um, whether it's partners, customers, employees, it can even be employees in your own organisation. You, you need designers, whether it's service designers, copywriters, user experience designers, industrial designers, architects. I mean, you can't avoid them. They're everywhere you look, basically. Um, but on the digital design front, look, it's it's incredibly important. All those interactions, people expect all of these things to just work now. You know, how fast the app responds to um, thinking about how accessible our products are, particularly with big, diverse audiences and people with varying abilities. Um, they're all incredibly important topics, but you need people dedicated to work on that. They don't, it's just not something people just pick up on the side. There's actually expertise and people that have been working in these fields for a really long time now that have and will bring a lot of value to the organization with their experience and, and their ways of working. Um, so the things I would, I would kind of look at doubling down on are one, absolutely the the research aspect up front so really diving into customer behavior and thinking about the if you already have products or you're looking to build products understanding your market your customers first and foremost is your primary goal um, and from there you can start mapping out the types of skills and things that you might need to provide a better product or service to them um, and, and there's lots of dimensions to that. I think there's the brand dimension, there's the kind of service design dimension of the full end-to-end -end customer experience um, through to the employee experience as well. Um, and so it's, it's something that is incredibly important that, yeah, it, that, that is absolutely needed. I don't think it's always needed at the same scale um, as different companies. And I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all 
uh, I think you also have to look at your company culture and your existing ways of working and make sure that whatever you do, you don't build a kind of ivory tower of designers over in a corner that never get to influence anything and just create amazing mock-ups. But you actually need people that, again, kind of deeply understand the customer, are deeply connected to the business strategy and the strategic priorities and understand how the company works from its revenue structure right through to its cost, everything, the whole thing. Um, and until you've kind of got designers doing that, I think it's, it is very challenging. They are kind of in an ivory tower designing mock-ups and maybe end up getting very frustrated that none of their work uh, sees the light of day in the way that they'd originally imagined it. So that that's that's another in this co in this final comment there is probably already the answer to the question i'm about to ask you but i'm going to ask anyway because there is a different angle um, in the question uh, do any company you know these companies that are thinking about creating a digital design team in house do they really need it in house or can they just work with agencies if they can do the agency can do the same kind of work why do they need them in house Yeah, I, I mean, I think you need people in-house for, uh, for honestly, like not just maintenance, but evolving. So yeah, there's a kind of tricky piece to this. I think if you're iterating and evolving over time, I think sometimes companies can get stuck and without the right kind of setup, are unable to make big leaps or innovate or change. Um, and often companies will then kind of default to going to an agency uh because it might be a bit easier but that that can cause a lot of headaches and i've seen that a lot in the past where you bring in agencies and um really what it does is kind of just cause organizational pain for everyone um someone else is brought in to do your job basically it's not a good feeling so um because you weren't creative enough or innovative enough um but you know some of the the most amazing innovations that i've seen um in the last Uh, six to ten years uh, across the journal and booking have come from not just designers internally but it can be software engineers data scientists product managers and so i think what you get from really fusing design into an organization um, is a new way of thinking whether we call it design thinking or something else it's just this additional creative kind of superpower hopefully asking lots of questions and kind of always diving and reframing problems so that they deeply understand them and that often brings out the best in people and the most interesting ideas and and from that you can kind of build out a, a lot more so i i also do think there is a way that you can work uh, with agencies in that model too but you need to set it up um, and and think through it and be really uh, i guess deliberate in how you want it to work culturally as well so you don't kind of put people out and make them feel sidelined that their job is not important they're just doing production design or maintaining the website versus being able to innovate and really push things forward so i think there's a there's a fine line there but it can absolutely work i i really love how you're talking essentially about the importance of building culture and through a dialogue with all the different functions inside an organization help the, the, the entire company changing the way of thinking, the way mm -hmm. of working, the way of, of serving the customers at the end. And it connected to also what you were saying earlier, this need of integration, of dialogue. You know, the two things together are, are really, really powerful. I totally agree. I see in PepsiCo something uh, very similar as well. Um, and another component of all of this is how you inspire that team. You know, is a team that is in house eventually, you know, is not exposed to um, the different projects and brands and industry that an agency could be exposed to. So, how do you inspire your own team um, every day? Also, a really good question. I think at the moment it's incredibly challenging because. You know, as a company, we're going through big restructures and we're going to sadly see colleagues and friends leave the organization. So there's kind of a level of sensitivity around pointing to the future and how exciting it might be. 
instead of focusing on the right here, right now and taking care of everyone and, and making sure, um, you know, the, the levels of anxiety and stress with all of our colleagues is, um, is, is, is looked after and cared for and people are being sensitive to it. So right now, definitely a challenging time, but I think in, in normal senses, um, I think there's, there's many different facets. I think one having a really crisp singular kind of vision, uh, as a design leader is incredibly important. And not only that, but that you have the full support of the C-suite and the CEO and the, the rest of the organization. So a, a lot of kind of what I spent my time on early is um, trying to understand, again, what we talked about earlier, the needs of the business and the direction of the company and where it was heading and uh, what was really important to it as also how it was going to grow in the future, how it was going to deal through the pandemic and make sure the things that I was doing aligned with that and they supported it and had my back too. Um, cause I think that's just, just as important, um, as having that kind of crisp singular vision that people can stand behind and understand. And I think something kind of more long-term so people understand the steps of how you're going to get there, but understand how they can contribute to it and that it's not laid out for them. And they're just going to be following a strict set of things that are already predetermined that there's a lot of space to, to create in that for them. Um, so yeah, not getting too hands on, even with the kind of senior management throughout design and other design leaders in the organization to, to make sure that there's space for people to still create, because that's where we see always the most impact, I think for the business and for our customers. So yeah, I, it, right now, like I said, it's challenging because we want to paint a, a, a great picture because I think there is a lot of opportunity, um, but it's it's a difficult time to do that because we do have to be sensitive to how everyone is feeling and, and what's happening um, right here, right now. I, I totally, yeah, I totally get it. I totally agree. Um, another challenge, if you want, of the society we live in, but then especially in company, uh, in companies like yours, uh, is the one of being as fast, reactive, agile as possible. Uh, I, I think to, in the Wall Street Journal, that was really to the extreme, I guess. I mean, news and, and people, yeah, yeah. you know, conversations. But this is true in so many different industries. You need to react fast. So what is the right balance between reacting fast with relevant content and being connected to people, but in the meantime, you know, governance and, and be aligned to, you know, the strategies of the company and, and really balancing, you know, the two, the two yeah. uh, dimensions. I love this question because actually I think about it a lot um, and I think it's very relevant to where I am now. And um, I actually think you need to realize that there's lots of different types of teams that can be doing different things on different time scales. Um, and people actually like fast paced challenges and those people should absolutely be working in that environment. And then there's people that would actually like to be planning and doing a lot of work on long-term or really complex technical problems that might take more than one year to solve because they required technical architecture updates and a whole bunch of other things. Right. Um, so there's all of these different timescales and I think there's very different types of teams you need to tackle them, Def different types of makeups. Um, and, and, and I think that that's something that's also something that a lot of companies I think have struggled with a little bit, uh, particularly more recently as they've scaled and grown and the way they've built products, digital products specifically in this context. Um, have, I think, struggled a little bit in, in understanding. It's not kind of a one-size-fits-all. Um, you know, this, the technology industry talks a lot about what's the best ratio of how many copywriters, designers, researchers, product managers, this, that, to make up an agile product team um, or, or, or any other for that matter. And, look, I don't think there is a perfect formula. I think it absolutely depends on the topic, the problem you're solving, um, how complex it is, how long it might take. Um, and I think we need a lot more flexibility and fluidity 
in software development. I think, I think we've already become too rigid in our thinking and planning and workforce planning around it. And we need to kind of break away from that again. Um, and I think that's really challenging because people like being embedded in teams and knowing their teammates and spending time with them and forming bonds. Um, and so creating flexibility and fluidity in that environment is also tricky because some people might not want to move around. They might want to stay exactly in one spot. So from a business standpoint, also challenging from a workforce planning point of view. Um, but a really good problem to look at in the future because I, I do think the time scales of different problems vary a lot. The type of work varies a lot. Um, so therefore, the type of people and skills you need vary as, just as much. And you talked not just now, but also earlier about the need of change and transformation. Is uh, Those are key words of, you know, the broader realm of innovation. That's what mm. innovation is about. And innovation is difficult, is risky, and implies also the ability to manage failure and mistakes. Uh, what's your relation with failures and mistakes uh, how, how do you leave them how you manage them for you and for your team look every day <laughs> <laughs> i think that's the only way i learn um and and look i you know i think there's there's failures on lots of different dimensions and particularly being in a leadership role i think um you know very sensitive to how everyone is kind of feeling at any one moment and their energy levels, their excitement for the future and what they're building and why they come to work. Um, you know, I think that's, that's always a really challenging one. Um, but look, no, I almost wasn't joking. You know, it, it definitely is daily and there's mistakes daily and there's things that, um, I would like to do differently, but, um, I always have to kind of keep moving forward. That's part of life and you can't control time and we have to keep, pushing and forward and try not to do it again. And, you know, I think I always focus on as much as possible, uh, really trying to, I guess, just understand where other people are coming from. I touched on it earlier, but um, it's very easy to just kind of try and dive into your thing that you want to talk about and not really kind of understand uh, where someone's headspace is at before you engage what you're doing. Um, and I think that's a mistake I've constantly made and I have to kind of keep reminding myself to pull back from, um, you know, the world doesn't always revolve around you and the thing that you're working on and the thing that you're doing. And so someone might be having a pretty shitty day and you have to acknowledge that sometimes and maybe make space for it. Um, and I think particularly right now, that's incredibly important. Right. And, and doing everything remotely, it's, it's really hard. So you actually have to uh, ask questions rather than sense it or, or try and read the room. So, yeah, trying to start with that and seeing how people's days are going so that you can manage the conversation differently or um, be more sensitive is super important or, or help uplift someone. They might be having a really shitty day and all you need to do is just spend 10 minutes laughing and that's great. That's okay. Um, that changes yeah, I don't know you motivates them. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know you personally, you know, that well. We, we met a few times in New York City, but I, I really yeah. love the sensitivity and the empathy I feel in your words. It's a theme of all your answers. You must be a wonderful people leader. Uh, I really feel it, you know, in your answers. Uh, as leaders, uh, often, you know, we are asked, well, how do you inspire your teams? I asked you earlier, how do you inspire your team? Um, where do you find instead your inspiration? Where do you hunt for inspiration? How do you stay inspired every day? Another great question. For me, it's time and space away from work and what I'm doing. I, I always recalibrate. I, I actually miss being on planes quite a bit because it was the one time that I always really switched off and would listen to music, maybe have a glass of wine and just start writing notes and sketching things. And they would be thoughts from all sorts of aspects of my life. And I think that's where I, you know, that was one moment that I kind of is, is missing now. Um, so um, one thing I was doing in Amsterdam was changing 
the way I structured my calendar, probably like you, it's pretty full and you, you, you're back to back Zoom meetings and then you try and find time for space and thought and everything else around that is challenging. Um, but creating moments during the day. So one of the things I was doing was um, on one-on-ones, basically having just a, a phone call. So I'd put my AirPods on if we didn't need to share a screen or look at slides or talk through something. Um, for my staff particularly, we would have our one-on-ones going walking and there's lots of beautiful parks in Amsterdam. So I would basically just spend a couple of hours walking through the parks, having my one-on-one calls um, and working through stuff. And at that same time, I think that gave me a little bit of space to to recalibrate, hopefully gave them a bit of space as well too. Um, and, and I really enjoyed that aspect of it. Uh, but other than that, look, it, it, it's just, yeah, being away from it engaging with other people, discussing new topics. So I don't, what I really loved about working at the Wall Street Journal and now booking and working with lots of clients in my own agency was I got to learn about so many different things and different people and what they cared about and what they did and how they built something. And and so I think what's also challenging with COVID is that I'm not getting to meet as many new people. Um, When I landed back in Australia and then went into obviously into quarantine, et cetera, um, in hotel, I ended up after that, I came out and we just hadn't seen people for a really long time. And we didn't really know many people in Amsterdam and it was, um, we were being pretty careful. So um, I, I remember going to the cafe here in, in Albury and starting to just basically make friendships with people again. <laughs> so like people that I didn't know, but I could just have these great, wonderful conversations with, and I would learn about what they're doing and those ideas and the things and the threads, you never know where it's going to go, but the stuff that comes from conversations with people always inspires me. And that's where I always get my kind of uh, new thoughts and, 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 and pieces of kind of inspiration from. So long winded answer, but maybe some food. For One last double question. <laughs> What's double question. your like favorite? It. Yeah, exactly. It's a double question because there is the past. What is your favorite project in all these years? The one that is close to your heart that you love the most. And what is a project that you love that you're working on right now? So my favorite project, oh God, there's, it's probably a tie, but I'll start with one because I think it was just as someone that had run my own business for, for those nine years, I got to work with a an Australian um whiskey maker a guy called david vitali who was just starting out making embarking on making an australian whiskey a modern whiskey kind of unshackled from tradition and i got to work with him from the very beginning on naming the distillery to the product to sourcing um the you know the the bottles from italy to like all of these kind of modern processes and learned so much about it we've worked on that for like three years to launch that And it was just so much fun. I remember right at the beginning, I got hooked because he was a great storyteller. And, you know, I learned about all of the elements of the process of making this whiskey. And and what kind of stood out in theirs was that right at the very beginning, and it's changed a bit since, but the uh, basically there's this old extinct volcano where they got the water from. And, you know, it was kind of filtered through the, through the through the um uh the coal etc and then everything else, every part of the process had this piece that was born in fire so it was australian barley that was toasted it was um south australian red wine barrels that were french oak that were then burnt and charred on the inside to kind of caramelize it so every every part of it was born in fire and we went through this whole kind of six month journey trying to get to a name and what we were doing and we we landed on starwood um and and the reason being that um all of these posts were born in fire and like the, you know the fire we know is the sun and a star and then we decided and this is what i loved about it we and his creativity and his passion for what we were doing that was so unique and interesting as well we decided we'd embark on trying to get real gold infused onto the bottles. So the first two and a half thousand bottles that he created, we actually worked with a manufacturer um, that was able to actually melt down 
gold with glass particles and fuse it onto the front of the bottle. So the first two and a half thousand had kind of real gold. So we, we kind of like took the whole process all the way through um, and working with him on that was just so much fun. And they've been really successful since now. They're on the West Coast in the US and um, done, done really great things. So um, that was a lot of fun. And what about now? What are you working on now that, I mean, something you can share, obviously. You know? Yeah, of course. Well, I think, look, travel is mobile. And we know, like, all I really kind of see going forward um, is how how people engage with all of the things that we do at Booking and all of our offerings from hotels to homes to transport to attractions and experiences and accessing them on your phone. It's just a really kind of simple thing that we should be doing really, really well and meeting people where they are in that moment and giving them everything that they need on their fingertips. So really just supercharging our apps um, has to be kind of our, our mission going forward and making sure that they're as good as they can possibly be. And there's so much we can do in that space to make it even better for people. Um, and there's so many situations where people are traveling and need support in offline mode and, and you know, geo and, and notifications and things and not and really taking it from the customer lens, like really solving for those really important pain points that people experience when they're traveling. So um, I think that's that's what I'm most excited about and what we're really going to be doubling down on going forward um from a from a ux standpoint is is our app and just making sure it's the best possible travel app out there i, I love this journey from the relation with a founder with an entrepreneur the craftsmanship of that uh of, of, of the first project and then the masses and the broad audience yeah. and, and and the traveling industry that is, is a beautiful is a beautiful journey so Shad, thank you so much for everything you have been sharing with us today. We talk about empathy and love and building teams, integration, business, design, digital, about so much. There are so many insights and I think it's so inspirational for many people in many different ways. So thanks for accepting, for having accepted our invite for having been with us today. Yeah, thank you, Mara. Really great to catch up and yeah, really appreciated it too. So thanks for the time out and, and getting some to spend some time together and have a chat for sure. and congratulations for your baby ah. coming <laughs> thank again. you very much <laughs> really appreciate it